Thank you. I just want to let everybody know I'm not being antisocial. I just have a bad back, so it's better for me to stand up. You don't want to see a grown man cry. Um, I'm going to start by introducing the speakers, the panelists. I'm going to start with Charlton McElwain, who is an associate professor of media, culture, and communications at New York University at Steinhardt. His research interests focus broadly on issues of race, media, particularly within the social and political arena. McElwain co-authored, edited the books Race Appeal, The Rutledge Companion to Race and, Ethnic and Ethnic Eth Ethnicity. Thank you. His other scholarly works have appeared in the International Journal of Press, Politics, American Behavioral Scientists, Communication Quarterly, and many more. Currently, he is researching individuals' cognitive and psychological responses to race-based messages and political ads. McElwain is exploring how people use digital media to influence both, both discourse and political work surrounding racial equality and equal opportunity. Additionally, he launched a new site, kidsoncolor.com, a forum for exchanging childhood stories about racial awareness. And that's Charlton McElwain. <laughs> Next, we have John Rosenthal. In 1995, Gun owner and recreational trap shooter, John Rosenthal, founded Stop Handgun Violence, an, organi an organization known for its giant billboard along the Mass Turnpike near Fenway Park. Their billboard campaign communicates the extent of the national gun violence problem, as well as practical solutions. In 2005, Rosenthal co-founded a membership organization called American Hunters and Shooters Association, AHSA, an alternative membership organization to the NRA for moderate gun owners who care about the rights as well as gun safety, conservation, and wildlife habitat, and the support for law enforcement. John Rosenthal is the president of the Meredith Management Real Estate Development and the founder of the Friends of Boston's Homeless, John Rosenthal. I want to start by saying thank you um, for this opportunity to discuss this important issue of violence and guns, a subject that I deal with every day at Street Safe. Uh, what the forum is really trying to avoid is a pro-gun, anti-gun conversation and delve into a conversation regarding the ways mass media portrays gun violence and covers gun-related crime all of which has a string of influence on the perceptions of guns, gun owners, and gun violence. Um, and perhaps we should define what we mean by media. By media, we're talking about video games, action, exploitation, and horror films, national and local broadcast news, newspapers, magazines, internet, social media, and books. So, but before we start our discussion, I want to ask everybody in the audience by a show of hands, and, and the panelists included, guns don't kill people, the media kills people. Who agrees with the title of this forum? That was my thought. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask the panelists to react to this title from the point of view of a gun owner who, be who believes that there should be some control on guns. Um, John, Rosenth John Rosenthal, you don't agree with the title. Why? Well, the common denominator in all the shootings and, um, and killings with firearms, and the numbers are staggering, um, about 32 to 40,000 Americans die every year from firearms in America. Uh, you multiply that out by the last 30 years, that's more Americans killed by guns in the United States than all U.S. servicemen and women killed 
in all foreign wars combined. 87 Americans that woke up this morning will be dead from firearms. 87, including eight kids under 19 years old. And post-Newtown, a lot of people became aware of federal gun policy. There is no universal background check for criminals, for firearms. So I'm a law-abiding gun owner. I go to a gun store, a federally licensed gun dealer, and they're required to run a background check. But Congress has said it's perfectly legal in 33 states for anyone to sell any amount of weapons without an ID or a background check, cash and carry, including Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire. In addition, Congress gave absolute immunity to the gun industry. You can't sue them. They can sell guns like two of the guns used at Columbine High School are sold, marketed have it as having a finish resistant to fingerprints. The firearm used at Fort Hood, Texas, um, is marketed as uh, capable of penetrating 48 layers of soft body armor. That's why the killer at Fort Hood on a military base, used that weapon. And if you go to a gun store and they run a federally licensed, uh, uh, they have to run a background check, that background check record has to be destroyed by the FBI within 24 hours because the FBI can't be trusted to know who buys guns. And the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms isn't allowed to regulate gun shows where no background check is required. When you put it all together, it's not the media that's killing 32,000 Americans a year. It's the uniquely unregulated gun industry who has bought the Republican Party and intimidated the Democratic Party in Congress. And the result is unrestricted access to guns without detection by criminals, by design. More gun violence more fear, more mass shootings. After every mass shooting, look what happens to gun sales. They spike. More profits, more NRA influence in Congress, less restrictions on guns, and more gun violence. Look, we saw in the 2012 election that you know the right wing in this country was trying to require that poor, primarily non-white Americans get an ID to vote, but no ID required to buy an unlimited number of guns. And I believe that it is by design, Congress, frankly, has this belief that the majority of gun violence happens to poor Non-white Americans, who cares? After Newtown, 20 beautiful white babies and small coffins, and all of a sudden, America is paying attention. Now, you combine that with video games that teach people how to, you know, be accurate and kill, and you combine that with movies and a lot of things. But compare the United States and Canada. We all see the same movies, the same TV programs, the same video games. The difference is you can't get a handgun in Canada. You can only get a long gun. That's the primary difference. We have unrestricted access to easily concealed handguns, more guns, more gun crime, and it's as simple as that. You start to put reasonable restrictions on guns like we have done in Massachusetts. We're an urban industrial state. We have the lowest firearm fatality rate in the nation and we have the most comprehensive gun laws. You want to reduce gun violence versus increase and maximize gun violence? Do what Massachusetts has done. And I can tell you, and I, I've been to the White House a number of times since Newtown. I was there again on Monday. A background check for criminals will not pass the U.S. Congress post-Newtown. That's what we're up against. Thank you. Same question. Can you react to it, Charlton? Sure. I um, I don't disagree with much of uh, what John said. In fact, I pretty much agree with all of it. Um, I do, however, believe that 
Uh, though I would not say I agree with the statement that media kills people. I do believe that the media does play an important, uh, important role. Um, and I think that when we look at and think about the things that John has brought up, we have to ask ourselves, why is that the case? How is it that we can have this disjuncture between the amount of gun violence that takes place in the U.S., the type, the type of weaponry that we have almost freely available, and our inability to pass reasonable legislation to try to help curb that. And I think one of the central ingredients influencing all of that is media. And when we think about media, there, there are two uh, sort of ways I like to distinguish it when we talk about media and its relationship to violence and handguns in particular. Uh, the first is that uh, sort of what we call direct media effects. And this is why I think most people uh, kind of cringe at this notion that the media kills people, right? That we uh, somehow are uh, giving over our responsibility as individuals who commit direct actions by saying, well, the media made me do it. But the reality is, is that 50 years of research into the relationship of violence in media, video games, televisions, movies, etc., has shown that there is a considerable link between the two. Think about it in this way. When you look at the correlation between violent media viewing and acting out violence, the same relationship uh, is almost as, as strong, the correlation almost as strong as smoking and lung cancer, right? The correlation, very strong. And of course, when we look at lung cancer as a uh, comparison here, we know several things. It does not mean uh, just because I smoke, I necessarily will get lung cancer. It doesn't mean that because I have lung cancer, it's because I smoked. Uh, and there are many other uh, comparisons, but the link between the two things are there. And it's the same with media, violent media, and gun violence. Uh, the second way, however, uh, and what I think is most important, is that the media doesn't tell us necessarily what to think, right? It doesn't control our thoughts. It doesn't tell us, believe this, think that, but it does have a powerful influence in telling us what to think about. And we call that the sort of agenda setting function of the media, that what the media chooses to cover is what audiences think is important. What we see day after day on the news, whether that's on the internet or on television or wherever we're getting our news from, is what we tend to believe are the most important issues of the day. Uh, and so that comes into play in, the, in many uh, areas that we'll certainly get into. The other is what we call framing. The media's ability to frame how it is we see and view a particular issue. Uh, and for this topic of guns and gun violence, that's typically meant uh, choosing between different frames that are brought to the table by either gun advocates on the one hand or people who uh, are looking at passing gun control legislation on the other. And one of the things that the media does is in the way that they report about guns and gun violence, they choose a particular frame of how to see it. For instance, we could talk about, as the NRA likes to do, talk about the Second Amendment, right? The question about guns is fundamentally about the Second Amendment and fundamentally about gun rights. And these are the two frames that we've seen most often uh, in the most recent debate around gun violence. And so to the degree that the media takes those frames and uses it uh, to frame their reporting of guns and gun violence, they shape the way that we, too, look at it. And so in many of those ways, and ways that we'll get into in much more detail later, the media has a powerful influence in shaping not only our actions and behaviors, but also our 
opinions about issues, about public policy, and how to best solve public problems. Could I add a little bit? Mm -hmm. Before we blame, and, and, uh, it, well said, and I'm sure there's connections, um, but there's always been mentally ill people, too. We just have never armed them with high-capacity military-style weapons and large-capacity clips. Um, before we blame anybody, look in the mirror. We are giving up our democracy to special interests. I mean, and, it, and it was before Citizens United. Special interests have been buying Congress for a long time. And, and I, w I was like, when did this start? And then I, I went and saw Lincoln. I don't know how many people saw Lincoln. And you know what? I think it's always been like that, right? They were buying votes then. Um, so maybe it's just human nature. And that, maybe that's why the Pennsylvania Constitution included term limits, because humans just don't have it in them to restrain themselves from benefiting themselves over time. I don't think that being a member of Congress or a legislature was ever intended to be a, uh, a full-time job for, for life. Um, and I spent a lot of time in Washington. Um, you know, I, I'd like free health care, and I'd like free travel, and I'd like free food. Uh, and guess what? They get that simply by voting certain ways and staying in office and not having a primary challenger. When, when it comes to the media, um, so we're to blame, folks, for Newtown. We're to blame for Aurora. We're, we're to blame for 32,000 gun deaths a year, year after year after year, because we don't think it's our problem. We think it's somebody else's problem. Well, Newtown showed it. Guess what? It might even be rich white people's problem. And it's not going to stop. I mean, the New Hampshire Chiefs of Police Association is giving away a gun a day in May. One gun every day in a raffle right over the border from Massachusetts, and the first gun they're giving away is a Ruger AR-15. It looks exactly like the AR-15 made by Bushmaster used at Newtown, just like the Smith & Wesson AR-15 used in Aurora to shoot 71, including killing a three-and-a-half-month-old in her mother's arms and a six-year-old. Same weapon used by the DC sniper. Anyway, it's called, you know, they're all AR, you know, the popular weapon is AR-15. Anyway, the, the, the police chiefs are giving away a Ruger AR-15 and a 30-round clip because that's what everybody wants post-Newtown. They're flying off the shelves. And so um, that weapon could just as easily end up in this, you know, New Hampshire. No background check. Given away by a police chief's association, they, they did agree they're going to do a background check. But in that state, that winner of the AR-15 can sell it to anybody he wants or she wants without an ID or background check, drive it into Massachusetts and open fire or anywhere else. When it gets to the media, look, I mean, we, we've seen it for years. If it bleeds, it leads. That's a motto the media lives by because they think that's what we want. And there's also a lot that goes into product placement in the media. Um, you know, Smith & Wesson owned uh, sort of the, the, they had the gun of choice, you know, the Dirty Harry 44 Magnum uh, until a few years ago where all of a sudden Austrian-made Glock hit, hit it big in all the gangster movies. Um, we have a public health crisis in this country. It's called gun violence. If hamburgers or a pharmaceutical drug, or you name it, resulted in 87 deaths a day, do you think the manufacturer wouldn't be regulated? Do you think there wouldn't be a background check? We need to treat firearms like inherently dangerous products, just like automobiles. Training, licensing, safety features. We have reduced car deaths by... 90% since 1950, and we don't ban cars. I mean, it's simple to reduce injuries and deaths from guns, 
You could do what they did in Skyfall with James Bond having a personalized gun. Smith & Wesson says they could make it. They, they said they could make it back in 1995 when I started and put up the first billboard. That was over 600,000 dead Americans ago. And they said they, wouldn't, they could do it, but they wouldn't do it because they'd be sued for not doing it yesterday. Well, this is the only place I've ever been to where it's in Springfield, Mass., it, where you have to go through a metal detector on the way out. Um, but they got tort reform. They got absolute immunity from lawsuits. They could make that gun. They agreed to do that. They made it public that they would do that. They went to the White House and said they'd do that. And they were boycotted by the you know, unrelenting NRA, put out of business. Uh, now they're a part of the problem, and they're selling Smith & Wesson AR-15 pistols that are easily concealed. So um, we bring business people in, bring law enforcement in. We need to get involved and try to take control of our democracy, and we will reduce injuries and deaths from guns. But I don't think it's fair to blame the media. The media has a role, and I, the, you know, post-Newtown, you're starting to see some, because I don't have kids, but I, I hear from parents that... It's just, it's getting a little harder to get these violent video games when you're a kid. I mean, if you're 14 years old and you want to buy a video game, a responsible video game store would say, I need to see your parent before you get, you know, this. And, you know, that's going to help. But nothing's going to make a difference until we decide that unrestricted access to guns by criminals and the mentally ill is good public policy. Now, if I may just pick up right where you left off there, I think that you make a good point, and I think the reality is that, you know, 14, when the kid goes in and maybe gets ID'd or needs some uh, background to get that video game, we're way beyond the point by then. And what I mean to say is that we live in a culture saturated with violence, and we live in a culture of guns. Uh, and I think that is maybe perhaps not started by the media, but certainly facilitated greatly by it. So I have a four-year-old. And it's amazing to me how you go to, from the transition from about two to four. And what happens in between, uh, at least it did with, with my son, uh, is about three, where he started going to preschool. And that moment, he came home and started shooting. Bang, 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 bang. I'm shooting lasers and darts and bullets and guns and people are dying. That's three years old. And we can talk about the astronomical amounts of gun violence that kids at that very young age are seeing on television, uh, on television shows that are made for them, right? And so... I think that in all of these media formats, we see perpetuated this idea that guns are part of what it means to be America. Right? When we look at television, the overwhelming majority of gun incidences portrayed on television are portrayed as justifiable. Justifiable shootings, either protecting one's home or shooting criminals or what have you, Almost always, it's justified to have it, it's justified to own it, and it's normal. And I think that is as much as uh, what you're pointing to, this sense that uh, it's not a big deal, at least not big enough a deal for us to go out and do something about it, like doing some of those things that you mentioned, challenging our uh, members of Congress and so forth, because eh, it's a part of who we are. Let me just piggyback on that, because in a recent interview, and I'm talking to you, Charlton, you said that there are two dominant and different sets of images when it comes to race and guns in media. Can you explain that, please? Sure. Um, and, and John mentioned it pretty, pretty well, actually. And that is, you see several things that are, are patterned that have uh, that's been a pattern for many years on television in particular, uh, and television news in particular, and reporting on uh, violent crime, gun crime. Number one, that the media overrepresents the number 
and incidences of violent crime, such that if you watch television a lot, you will have an inflated sense of the number of uh, violent murders, gun deaths, etc., that are actually taking place. Uh, but you also see that when we look at the perpetrators, most often represented in news media, those are most often black. When you look at victims, those are almost always white, primarily white women that are represented as victims of handgun violence. And women are indeed those who are least frequently to be the victims of violence in real life. African Americans are four times more likely than whites, black men in particular, to be victims of handgun violence. And so what we see is this very dissonant picture. The perpetrators, the victims that are there in real life are not those that we see on the news. And what does that mean? It ultimately tells us, as the media gives us what we want or what they think that we want, it sets up this kind of idealized picture. So white women and children are the primary victims. Blacks, for whom uh, uh, they're the victims, as I said, of gun violence most often, are ignored and not uh, reported on as victims. So we're pushing them to the side. And this is the image, I think, that plays into this sense of justification for guns and so forth. If our image of gun violence and our image of gun victimization are poor, defenseless white women and children, then why not have a gun? Isn't it almost our duty to have a gun to protect those that at least the media portrays as those who have most to lose in terms of being victims of this gun violence. Sure. I have a, if I could add on to that, you know, 87 Americans will die today from guns, and you won't hear about that. You hear about the mass shootings, um, the high-profile mass shootings, and there have been a lot of them. Uh, I think there have been, you know, 26, for instance, uh, that I could name off, you know, over the last 20 years um, of mass shootings. And guess what? Not one of them was done by an adjudicated mentally ill person who would have been prevented from getting a gun. So, you know, what you're hearing now after all these mass shootings, oh, it's not the gun, it's the mentally ill. No. No, I mean, it's true that people who do mass shootings have real serious problems. And it's also true that, you know, a huge percentage of the suicides that happen every year are temporarily insane teenagers because that's what they are. But you don't arm them when they, you know, if it's easy to, to find a gun when a boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with you, you know, a depression can turn into a death. A gun in the home is many times more likely to be used against you or a family member or by a family member than uh, against an intruder. Um, and, you know, to take it one step further, uh, the race issue involved, 23 states now have stand-your-ground laws. You probably heard about stand-your-ground the first time with Trayvon Martin, an un armed African-American with Skittles in his pocket walking home who was targeted by a white, well, a, a, a non-African-American guy who was more or less, uh, you know, thinking he was protecting his, his, uh, his neighborhood. Uh, in Florida um, and in 23 states, you can now kill somebody, an unarmed person, simply because you felt threatened. That's quite a concept. And in the state of Florida, there's like a 300% drop in being able to, per to prosecute 
because people are just simply saying, well, I felt threatened. What are you going to do? The law supports that. Um, that's basically, you know, the right to kill anyone you don't like or you don't like the way they look. So, you, you know, you just put it all together, folks, and while we've slept, the gun, unregulated gun industry and their, you know, their shills in the National Rifle Association have dominated and, and created a U.S. gun policy designed to tie the hands of law enforcement, provide unrestricted access to criminals, And that's why we're in the, the d dilemma we have. I mean, the, the National Rifle Association, I, d I don't hunt much, I skeet shoot, but when you get a duck hunting license, and you need a duck hunting license to kill ducks, <laughs> you are limited to three rounds. You cannot have more than three rounds in your duck hunting shotgun. Even if it's a five-round magazine, you've got to put two wooden plugs in. Why? To protect the duck population. Now, I love ducks, and they mate for life, and, you know, I, I'm a birder. But guess what? Congress has said you can have 30 to 100 rounds to kill people. Police carry 13 to 17 rounds before they have to reload. Police officers die when they're reloading. That's when they're vulnerable. And how is it possible that we have allowed our Congress to give 10, 30, 100 round magazines to criminals? I don't know the answer to that, but you have to ask yourselves. Next question I have has to do with news coverage. I'm going to have a question for each of you, then I'm going to have a question for both. Um, and again, from my experience at Street Safe, and, and both of you have mentioned this as well, um, there's, there's too little coverage on the many violent deaths of inner city youth across the country in comparison to wall-to-wall -to -wall coverage of the relatively infrequent but still tragic mass shootings. So my question um, Charlton, if you will, if local and national broadcasts did concentrate more coverage on the culture of violence among our youth, would we then criticize them for dwelling on the negative? That's a good question. Um, and it, it may be that some of us would. Um, and I think that the reason it could lead to that is because focusing on that in that way would force us to ask ourselves some questions. Why is this possible? What about the context in which these folks live and go to school and work every day? What about that makes them subject to this type of violence, both as victims and perpetrators? Uh, and asking those questions would uh, not reveal, I think, some, some positive th things, both about those communities, but also about those uh, of us who live outside of some of those communities. Uh, and so I think that you probably would have some who'd say, look, why are you focusing now on uh, South Side of Chicago and pointing out the ways in which uh, gang members and drug dealers and so forth are uh, killing folks, so on and so forth, um, why is it that uh, teen pregnancy is rampant? Why is it that single-parent households are here? Um, and all of that has a, a bearing on things. And so to focus on it would require us to ask those questions. Some would not like it and think it was negative, but I think it is what we have to do. If we're ever to go and actually solve the problem, and say we care enough to try to solve the problem, then we have to put everything out on the table, the good, the bad, and ugly, as it were. Okay. 
I was on uh, MSN. I'm on MSNBC every week now as a result uh, since Newtown. The good news is it's still live. You know, people are still paying attention, um, even as we've been seeing in the last couple of days. Uh, you know, the, the U.S. Senate, the democratically controlled Senate, um, will not take up the assault weapon bill. They will not uh, deal with magazine clips. I, that, that will not come out. Of the of the Senate, and it'll be lucky if we get a background check for criminals um, out of the U.S. Senate, and it will die in the House. Um, so I, I I'm often asked to speak about this stuff, and uh, I was on MSNBC right after Newtown with General McChrystal, who talked about the AR-15, the the Bushmaster AR-15. Now that that's made in Maine, it's a company called Cerberus. Uh, capital management, you might own their stock. They own Chrysler, too, and they've purchased uh, about 40% of the gun industry, including Bushmaster and ammunition. Nice Jewish guy from Princeton, Steve Feinberg, um, rolled up this, this conglomerate called the Freedom Group. Uh, in, any, in any event, uh, General Crystal was, was talking about this AR-15 and the 223 rounds that were used to kill the six and seven year olds. The 223 round is about that big um, and it is designed for maximum soft tissue damage. So when it hits the body, it rolls to maximize soft tissue damage. It's a military weapon. It's a military round. If we saw pictures of what those six and seven year olds look like after hitting, and they were each hit three to 11 times, with this 223. I don't know if we could take it, but you know what? We deserve it. And I thought about it as far as if I could get those pictures, I'd be very unpopular, but I would have put it up on a 250-foot billboard on the Massachusetts Turnpike for 250,000 people to see. And maybe we do need to see that. Because that's what's going on. And that's what's going on 87 times today. And, you know, we stopped the war in Vietnam when a million people marched on Washington. Part of the reason those million people went to Washington is they were seeing the pictures of the people killed on the nightly news. They saw the death toll. What are we doing? We're sanitizing gun violence? Largely because we don't think it's our problem because they're largely, you know, not kids that look like us or, or people we think, you know, somehow. Well, 32,000 gun deaths last year. 19,000 were suicides. You could fill Fenway Park three times over with the 110,000 kids killed over the last 30 years, and half of those kids would be largely white kids from rural and suburban America, and the other would be non-white kids from urban America. The white kids are largely dying from accidents and suicides. The black kids are largely dying from homicide. You can't get a job in the inner city, but you can get unrestricted access to guns. And believe me, if white kids were dying at the rate that black kids are dying, you would start to see more pictures on the news. And we, if I could just continue where you left off there, I think what we do is not even sanitize when we're talking about the, the inner city. We compartmentalize. We simply say this is not there, right? Our streets, our neighborhoods are segregated. We don't have to drive by these areas. We certainly don't live in them. What happens there stays there. Uh, and if I've got a news media that's not reporting on anything that's going on there, then it's easy for me to say there's nothing going on. There's not a problem. There's not an issue. And therefore, I don't have to deal with it. Uh, and so I think that that, as much uh, as anything, is the way in which we have uh, sort of this bifurcated system where we say, basically, this group and the type of violence that's going on there is the consequence of a deficient culture. They are not like us. They don't look like us. They don't live like us. We do not care about them. And I'm not saying that we explicitly say this to ourselves or that we believe it, but we compartmentalize and choose not to see it, and therefore it doesn't matter. 
Uh, and then on the other hand, when we have either the mass shootings or we have violence uh, of whites, then it's a problem. And still not enough of a problem to make us really do much. Um, but it's different. You know, on that point, um, we were talking before, I, uh, <clears throat> I built a, a community center uh, in Grove Hall, Roxbury, the center of gun and gang activity here in Boston. And I'd asked Mayor Menino if I could take that, some of you may have noticed that there used to be this white bubble uh, on City Hall Plaza. And it was for, and it was, it was like the Christmas display with little elves two weeks a year, but it was sat vacant. And I was spending a lot of time, I went with a Paul Joyce, a mutual friend of ours, police, uh, he was a part of the gang unit for a long time, uh, and drove around with him one night, you know, the center of gang and gun activity in Boston and it's Grove Hall. So um, they had no community center. 19,000 residents in Grove Hall, Roxbury, it's where the most gun violence happens in Boston. Um, about 457 residents in Grove Hall responsible for 12,000 arraignments. I mean, these are the, the tough kids that we've lost. And the police know who they are, and they're going to get them. You know, one family, four generations, 180 arraignments. Um, they're gobbling up all of our, you know, resources in, in public service. But the majority, 98% of the residents living in Grove Hall are playing by the rules. You have no idea as parents what it must be like. I know Mary and others know what it's like to lose a child. We don't have the gene to lose a child. And, and these parents are playing by the rules. They're, they're doing everything right. And their kids walk out the door, and they want to walk two blocks to their school, but they can't. they got to go 10 blocks because those two streets are gang-controlled and out of control. And their kids are getting shot in drive-bys. They're getting um, intimidated. And, uh, and they're living in a war zone. In the wealthiest country in America, uh, we have relegated our poor uh, largely non-white Americans into these virtual, you know, war zones controlled by gangs. We would not stand for that in Newton or Wellesley or Dover. It wouldn't happen. But why do we allow it to happen here? And then we say, oh, there's no jobs, but unrestricted access to guns on top of it. If I, you know, I was a restless kid. If I grew up there and the only way I was going to get a BMW was to sell drugs and carry a gun for self-defense... I don't know that I could say I wouldn't have done it. We are, you know, our, we are asking these families to endure um, something that we would not endure ourselves. Okay. I was concerned if I'd had enough questions to uh, get through, uh, but I obviously am okay. Um, so I'm going to open it up to questions right now, and I just want to remind people, a question starts with who, what, when, how, and why, and ends with a question mark. Um, so we can take questions now. Please step to the mic. I'm sorry. Would you comment, I think, on the um, Connecticut shooting and the role that Nancy Lanza played because you had a, a child it's questionable whether he would have gotten a gun but he did get guns so could you comment really on her role and what would you do taking that as a lesson and how do we go forward because it's not just about not giving them a handgun I think it's also about how do we instill in people responsible ownership of any gun oh it's such a good question had Nancy Lanza locked her guns like is the law in this state, um, chances are he couldn't have accessed the gun. He tried to go to a gun store and he wasn't successful. And his mother left her, you know, her high-powered Bushmaster and large ammunition clips and ammunition, and, you know, available. As I mentioned, I don't have kids, but I have guns and I lock them and I lock the ammunition separate. And if I had kids, I wouldn't take a chance, especially boys, because, you know, just... We knew where the playboys were, and the kids and the boys know where the guns are. Um, so um, that safe storage is enormous. If I were to rate 
what we need to do to prevent the majority of the 30,000 gun deaths every day, I would say, uh, every year, I'd say, universal background checks for everybody, not just for law-abiding gun owners, but how about, like, criminals, too? Safe storage. Make it mandatory. Massachusetts and 17 states have a safe storage law. We have dramatically reduced injuries and deaths among toddlers and teenagers as a result of safe storage. And what it says is that you have to lock your gun unless it's in your direct control. So if you feel safe sleeping with your hand on a, a trigger of a loaded gun under your pillow, go for it. But if you leave the house, you got to lock the gun so your kid can't get away can't get access to it. You know, the, the Second Amendment, well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of the free state, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's what it says, and it always meant you had a right to a National Guard until the Bush court and Scalia wrote differently, but that was okay. He said you could put reasonable restrictions. You can't ban them, but you can put reasonable restrictions on how they're sold. So now the president's talking about background checks, magazine clip. Uh, pro, uh, limitation in assault weapons. And every time he mentions even a background check, you hear in the media, you're banning guns, you're taking away my rights. So every time we talk about safe storage, we hear, oh, you need it to kill the black guy that's going to break into your house. No, you can have your gun and it can be loaded if you want, but if it's not in your direct control. So there's all this misinformation about safe storage. It's the key. And then you put consumer protection standards on real guns like toy guns that have a multiple standards on how they're made. Real guns have none. And then you make law enforcement an ally versus the enemy of gun rights and you revoke immunity to the gun industry. Now you are going to reduce injuries and deaths with, from, from guns and I think you need the ammunition clip too but you've got to start with safe storage. Good ideas, Mr. Rosenthal, but uh, tell us how to get those done. My question is, you stole half of it with your reference to the National Guard. The NRA's ultimate fallback is the Second Amendment. Uh, the only well-regulated reg reg <laughs> regulated militia that I know of in this country are the National Guard under the um, uh, surveillance of the state governor or the Army Reserves. Why can't we urge the well-regulated militias which exist to uh, have the guns because a gun in your closet, however well-locked, has nothing to do with a well-regulated militia. Could you speak to that? Sure. Um, you know, after the massacre in Newtown, we all waited with bated breath for the NRA to maybe, you know, come forward and offer some solution. And the offer, the solution was arm guns. schools. Um, there's 130,000 primary and secondary schools. Um, they all have lots of doors and windows, but if you put two armed police officers at every school, that is the size of the U.S. Marine Corps. I'm not sure how we're going to pay for that. Um, and there were two armed police officers at Columbine High School who were outgunned by teenagers with assault pistols and large ammunition clips. So I'm not sure you can give handguns to them. You might have to give them assault weapons and maybe then tanks because, you know, we make tanks available too, I guess. But um, the Second Amendment was always clear until recently. It was every court said it's the right to have a National Guard. And... Uh, the, the court recently wrote that you can't ban handguns in the D.C. Heller case. And by the way, the last time I was in this room, I was debating the lawyer that successfully argued that case to the U.S. Supreme Court. And by the way, I didn't go to law school or even finish college. But I know the issue, and I beat him in this debate, which was really quite something, and the college students loved it. <laughs> but nonetheless... Um, uh, it, it will now, the next big challenge will be, because Scalia wrote, you can't ban handguns, but you can put reasonable restrictions on how they are sold. And he also went on to say that uh, it, it, you can't ban weapons in the common use at the time. And he even said that assault weapons don't fit that category. Um, so now the gun lobby is uh, supporting lawyers to challenge what is reasonable. And they're coming after Massachusetts because we have 
uh, the most comprehensive gun laws and the first in the nation consumer protection standards. And guess what? We also have the lowest firearm fatality rate of any state. Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, three of the 33 states that don't even require background checks, have two and three times greater firearm deaths than urban industrial Massachusetts. So the Second Amendment is, is uh, it's going to continue to live, uh, and it's being manipulated by misinformation, money, and politics. And um, I, as I mentioned, I was in Washington this week. Um, you would think that the sequester, the debt ceiling, uh, you know, those are pretty big issues, right? I mean, they're not resulting in 87 dead Americans like guns, but they're pretty big issues. Do you know what the biggest concern right now among members of Congress on the Republican side of the aisle was that the Easter egg hunt was getting uh, canceled because of the sequester? That, and that the tours of the White House were being limited and the Republicans, you know, now they're up in arms. Um, so uh, the Second Amendment uh, has been manipulated and uh, it's going to be continued to be challenged. One of the things I'd be interested to do is one of those kind of TV shows where you just walk out in the middle of downtown somewhere and ask people what the Second Amendment says and what exactly it gives you the right to. And I guarantee you we would find that most people do not know the ins and outs of what is afforded by that constitutional provision. And I think one of the right reasons that that is is because our media so often goes right to the conflict, which means I need the anti-gun, pro-gun, the far extreme. And that means talking about absolute uh, handgun ownership and freedom to have it, or absolute bans. And there's never any talk about anything in between, because to talk about safety measures and trigger locks, oh, that's boring TV, right? We wouldn't want to put that on. We couldn't hold an audience with that. And so we end up talking about that, and the average person out there thinks that when you say you have to have a background check, you can't have my gun. You can't steal my gun. I'm protected by the Constitution. And I think much of the function of that is a function of media to a large degree. I think you made it. I think you made an excellent point about the media. I would just slightly disagree with your thought about misinformation. I would think it would be more accurate to call it disinformation which in psychological warfare is used specifically to confuse people and mislead them. Now, if anyone wants to join a well-regulated militia, there's a nice place down at 142 Tremont Street called the Armed Services Recruiting Station where you can join a militia and they will teach you how to use guns. One thing you mentioned, which I thought was a rather interesting prospect that nobody has seemed to talk about, you said that these companies are owned by conglomerates. Now, in the olden days, people had pensions in the previous century. The pensions owned stocks in companies. I think it might be a very interesting thing to look into some of these companies and see how many of the pension funds hold stock in companies that own guns and if... Um, and to paraphrase Chuck Colson, uh, Boston's contribution to the Nixon administration, when you have them by their assets, their hearts and minds will follow. A thought, which is my, I don't like people say um, that will kill me or using gun metaphors, but that is my uh, incendiary thought for the day. I would like people to then look into their portfolios and go accordingly. I think that's a great idea, and you don't have to go very far in Massachusetts because Cerberus, who owns 35 to 40 percent of the gun industry, Bushmaster and Ammo, also owns Steward Healthcare, hmm. the third largest employer hmm. in Massachusetts. So they are making money on selling the guns, and they're making money in the emergency rooms. Hmm. Hmm. Um, teachers, the California Pension Fund was invested in Cerberus. And I guarantee you I, uh, there are people in this room who work at companies who are invested 
or their own portfolios are in Cerberus. Um, when I told the Boston Globe about Cerberus and Steward, uh, and they wrote about it, the next day Cerberus announced uh, they were selling their gun uh, companies. Uh, they have not <laughs> done that yet. Um, Bushmaster is, uh, you know, you could buy a Bushmaster for twelve, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500. You know, now it's $2,500. The 30-round clip used to be $12. It's now $60. They're making money hand over fist. They hired Lazard LTD to help them sell, but then they held up the sale to see what kind of federal regulations were going to happen while they rake in the profits. Um, but Stewart Healthcare is going to be pretty sensitive to phone calls, too. And Ralph De La Torre runs Stewart Healthcare here in the Commonwealth, and you probably wouldn't appreciate me telling you all that, but give him a call. <laughs> John, I have a question for you, but John, I'd like you to make a comment also. You talked about the strong correlation between violent media and violent behavior. What do we do about that? Well, the, how, how, do, how do we take that result from your research and others' research mm -hmm. and make a change in the way we do things? Well, I think that what we, uh, the most obvious thing to do is to cut down, restrict, uh, et cetera, our exposure to that type of media. Um, that would mean regulating it in many ways, uh, both in the home, where we're talking about parents regulating what's on television, what kids watch. Um, and I don't know about those of you who may have young children, but YouTube is a bigger player, I think, than TV these days. That's where my son, who likes my iPhone so much, ends up at. And inevitably, you end up on video material that they should not be watching. Um, so I think various ways of restricting that uh, exposure uh, the research shows that one of the things that really um, uh, heightens the chances of this link is the repetition. And this is most uh, uh, palatable in video games, where you have hundreds and thousands of repetitions of firing. And if you're playing that, and what the research shows is that repetition in great numbers has a desensitizing effect, essentially, that we become used to that motion, used to what effect it has, uh, and used to seeing it as normal. Uh, and so I think that controlling our exposure uh, really is what has to be done. Of course, that's easier done or easier said than done, right? Yeah, another thing, somehow I We've lost our way um, with the two working family, our two parent working families, and um, you know, kids don't choose to come into this world, and we bring them in, and then we don't pay a lot of attention to them in a lot of cases. I mean, we all need love, we all need attention. That's all we strive for, and yet it's hard to get. And um, you know, these kids didn't choose to be ignored. But a lot of them are because we are so busy. You know, we're so busy with our work. We're so busy with our iPhones. We're so busy with our phones and everything else. But I think that's a lot of it is pay attention and go for a walk with your kid versus stick them in front of a TV set or a computer. Um, I'm, I'm left with this feeling of what do we do? How? How? What's the... You know, you were right. I was active in the anti-war movement. And, and when the My Lai incident hit the cover of Time magazine, we were here in Massachusetts organizing the moratorium to take place in October. And that was our organizing vehicle. We had no problem. And it changed history because people all over the country. What do you do now with all these incredible statistics that you have? that everybody in this room is kind of dumbfounded because you put them together, the three of you. Where do you go with the tremendous amount of information that we have to say to people, this is our country, to say the things that you started off saying 
and to get them to stay with this so that there's some impact. And and if it grew, it would make a difference because politicians want to get reelected. I mean, the formula is there. It's not very complicated. But I'm stuck with, I'm going to leave here tonight. I'm going to tell my kids about it. You know, my husband couldn't come. He's going to hear a whole lot about it. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about writing up all those statistics because they're, they're, they like blow your mind away. But what do I do? You know, what do I, you know... Where do we go? Well, uh, take down this number, 202-224-3121. That is the switchboard at the U.S. Capitol. That's a start. John, <laughs> um, I'm sorry to interrupt sure. you, but just I just wanted to say that driving in, NPR has been doing a lot of I stuff. I know about, you. <laughs> nice to see you, John. Nice, it's been a long time. Um, yeah. They've been doing a lot of, of uh, a lot of stories this week about gun violence. And driving in, I heard that the Congress had passed the resolution, the continuing resolution, so they don't shut down the government, and our budget will continue until the end of the fiscal year. The NRA managed to slip in three um, now permanent. Um, I don't know, laws, I guess, um, into this continuing resolution, one of which is so benign that, that it, it does not allow um, for a study to be done to even find out how many guns there are out there. Uh, the, three very, you know, benign things. They, they have so much power. So I'm just following your question. Like, and, and then... NPR had a series of Congress people saying, you know, it was either that or shut down the government. They had to vote for it, right? You know, yeah. talk about feeling absolutely helpless in the face of the power. Yeah, what she's talking like about is uh, the National Center for Disease Control and Prevention, you know, a really radical organization, uh, you know, tracks injuries and deaths and epidemics and health. And um, they were tracking gun injuries and deaths. And they had seven states. They had a study. They had $2.6 million from Congress to study seven states, including Massachusetts. And they, they issued their report. And the report said that states with tougher gun laws had lower firearm injuries and deaths than states with lax gun laws. More guns, more gun violence. Um, the NRA went after them and uh, cut, had Congress cut all $2.6 million of funding. Kill the messenger. Uh, in, t in the year 2000, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives um, I issued a report in the last year of the Clinton administration that said that 1% of federally licensed gun dealers were responsible for selling 57% of guns traced to crime. You would think Congress would say, good job, ATF. Go get the 1% of bad dealers that are giving all the other dealers a bad name. Oh, no. Um, Congress said to the ATF, you can't report that any longer. And then they passed a law called the Tehard Amendment that said if you do, 10 years in jail for the, for the ATF agent that shares where crime guns come from. So that's what we're up against. I mean, Barbie, right? <laughs> well, so I haven't seen Barbie like in 20 years, but um, yeah. So um, what do we do? We have to get involved. So you got to, I can tell you today. So in Massachusetts, we got tough gun laws, but we're trying to improve them a little bit more. And uh, David Linsky, our state rep, has uh, proposed some. The governor's proposed some. Uh, there's going to be a hearing coming up. Um, and I can tell you that every legislator is getting 100 calls a day in our state from the gun lobby. They, they, they ha are organized. They take 10 names a day. They'll alternate days on which people they call. Um, this is a well-organized machine, um, and we are not. The majority of Americans, the silent majority, are letting this happen because we're more interested in other things. Now, you know, we can change that. We're still a democracy. Um, so, yeah, make the calls. Call stop handgun violence. Laura Heyer is back 
in the back of the room, and we have information that you can take where where you can, and then you got it. You know, one of the best thing that's you know one of the very best things that's going on right now is President Obama, since he's not running again, has turned over all twenty million of his email addresses, names, addresses, and everything to Jim Messina, who was his campaign manager and a staff, and they've turned Obama for America into organizing for action, and they're putting boots on the ground, command and control in D.C., uh, well-funded, as is Bloomberg, with Mayors Against Illegal Guns and our own mayor, Mayor Menino, um, and OFA, Organizing for Action, is taking on guns, immigration, and climate change, and they have the ability to change the world if we all join and help them do it. The president knows, again, I was at the White House on Monday, they know nothing's coming out of Congress. And the idea is then we will use the fact that Congress has not acted in the 2014 election and and force people to, to... run and take a position on background checks, magazine clips, and assault weapons. Interestingly enough, uh, in that same continuing resolution is a amendment similarly slipped in by Tom Coburn, a uh, senator from Oklahoma, uh, that defunds research from the National Science Foundation uh, for political science, particularly for research into Congress, right? So we cannot fund research that would help us understand how Congress is doing, or better still, the failures uh, of Congress. Um, So I think that's a bit ironic. Um, But I think that one of the things, you know, all of these things we have to to do in order to have some kind of action and influence. One of the things I would like to see happen and I think should happen is there has to be a group of gun owners out there that take away some of the voice from the NRA. I grew up in Texas. I lived for 12, 13 years in Oklahoma. Plenty of friends with guns, around gun culture. I know that everyone who is a member of the NRA, who is a gun owner, does not share the absolutist positions and rhetoric of the NRA. Yet most of them don't take much action. Uh, And I think that the NRA thrives on that kind of solidarity. Our members are going to stay loyal uh, no matter what, even though... Research shows that many members of the NRA have very moderate views when it comes to guns and are in favor of many of these common sense gun control measures. But without withholding their membership, without withholding their funds, the organization maintains its voice, its control, its power to lobby in Congress, and they are the single most factor holding up uh, any of this legislation and have for 30, 40 years. I am so glad you brought that up. Um, we are in the process of creating an organization called American Gun League. Um, it is funded um, by a guy that just sold uh, a huge company for over a billion dollars. He lives here in Massachusetts, and he wants to do exactly that. To give you a sense, there are 70 million gun owners in the country, maybe 80. There's 3 million members of the NRA. And uh, those members of the NRA were polled, and 75% said they support a background check uh, for all gun sales. Uh, Colorado just did that, a pretty western state. Um, Over 90% of Americans support background checks. I don't know that 90% of Americans support anything, but they support background checks. Um, So the NRA membership is $35. It cost them over $100 to get that member. It is a loss leader. They just need numbers to tell members of Congress, we got 3 million people, we're going to you know, hold signs against you. Well, I believe that we'll be able to build this American Gun League and have um, many more millions. Um, the NRA money 
entirely, almost entirely comes from the unregulated gun industry. It's payback. The, you know, the gun industry doesn't have lobbyists. They just have the NRA. And the NRA gets money, and then they put their magazine together, and they put concealed carry, you know, as their primary and stand your ground as their primary initiatives, which are, you know, simply designed to create more gun violence and more gun sales. So it, that is what is exactly what's needed. We will change the world as far as gun violence prevention if we have that kind of membership organization. We've got 10 minutes, so I just want to everyone to be conscious of that and that doesn't I'm not trying to deter you from asking the okay. question. Um, my name is Kathy Rabool. I've worked in three programs with incarcerated youth um, from nonviolent to youth who have committed homicides. Um, one of the things I noticed in the first facility I worked in which was with nonviolent offenders, I want to be very clear it was nonviolent offenders, um, was I could drop any topic in the middle of the room and it would turn to guns. That there was an excitement and almost an addiction to guns. Mm -hmm. And there was a feeling, I th an interesting sort of dynamic of a feeling of safety if you have a gun, and also a feeling of power, and also literally excitement. And some, some youth have been described as they're shaking like a heroin addict until they have that gun, and it's a feeling. So I, um, after I left that facility, um, I was watching the news, and one of the young men had committed a homicide. And a few months later, another young man who was um, in, in the facility um, I got a call from a friend, and she said one of my students had died. So the excitement of the gun, that attachment to that gun, had resulted, and was, I believe, really part of two deaths. And, and as you all know, many more, but that was my microcosm, what I saw. Um, one of the things I'd like to say about the second death was um, he was a young person that was, it was covered one day in the news, and there was another young a white man that was um, killed in a hockey accident that was covered three or four days and the tone of the um, coverage was different too so <clears throat> my sense is what do you do with that excitement so I'm hoping you'll answer that too um, what do you do with that excitement how do you prevent that excitement from developing in the first place that sort of energy around guns ad addiction and attraction to guns and how do you if you're already working with kids that are already kind of troubled how do you stop it so how do you start in the first place and how do you continue you know um I would venture to say that that excitement that you saw was probably fear. Um, most of the young people that we work with, and, and they don't want to be shot at. Most of them look for us as street safe. We have street workers whose job is to go out every night and find that 1% that are doing the shooting and negotiate their issues. And in a lot of cases, Young people are asking us, can you please talk to those kids over there? Mm -hmm. They couldn't do that if no one was the intermediary. They want somebody to intervene on their behalf. Um, and the, the shaking and the conversation around guns, in my experience, that's fear and it's having some safety because you don't want to be unarmed when, you're, when your enemy yes. is, is, is looking for you and hunting for you. So we've got to create other alternatives. And, and we've gotten a lot of young people to put down guns. Then the question becomes, what do you replace it with? Mm -hmm. I don't know that I have much, much more to offer than uh, that. Um, I think the ironic thing is that that loop and that circle that is I have and feel safety with the gun, which I almost inevitably know is going to result in violence from that gun, either to someone else or to myself. Um, and so that same thing that makes me feel safe is the same thing that will ultimately uh, make me a victim uh, in some way. In 1999, um we had uh, the lowest crime rate in recorded history in this country uh, at a time where we had over $2 billion more in law enforcement programs and economic development. Um, the country was, the economy was raging. Um, and, you know, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. And so, 
even in our poorest neighborhoods, it was job creation. I mean, even in our shelters where I work, we were, I mean, when I started Friends of Boston's Homeless, we had 25% of our homeless going to work every day in Boston, but couldn't for, afford um, jobs. I mean, minimum wage, you make 350 bucks. Average rent's 1600 in Boston. So we're, we got the working poor in our shelters. But not 25%, 45% were going to jobs from our shelters and coming home. Think about the courage involved there. That's a whole other story. But um, I, I just think economic opportunity and treating people well and, and paying attention and giving them the ability to make money versus sell drugs. And if you're in that world, you know, you do not take a knife to a gunfight. Hi, um, I live in Charlestown. My name is Mary Kay Donovan. And this question is really directed to you, John. You had brought up that um, the reason that the Vietnam War could come to a halt was because people marched on Washington. And I remember distinctly that because I was there. And I also remember my parents' generation thinking that the government could do no wrong, absolutely no wrong, and that Everybody who was involved in this were just long-haired people on drugs and whatever. But there was a draft then. And that's what made the, other, the older generation sit up and say, wait a second, maybe these kids aren't so drugged up. Maybe they do have something here that we should look at. And it was when the entire country mobilized against the Vietnam War that it came to a halt. We just went through a 10-year Iraq War, which... I think most people in this country felt it was senseless, as senseless as that war, but there was no march because there was no draft. Mm. So how do we, when we leave here tonight, I go back to this woman's question. I mean, we can go to meetings like this and lectures all the time. How do you mobilize people to, to it's a grassroots thing? I mean, I just finished watching thousands upon thousands standing in the rain in Italy for white smoke to appear. And then I was at the inauguration in January on the Washington Mall where there were thousands of people. But there's no thousands of people standing anywhere no. to get a ban on assault weapons and to put an end to this just bizarre behavior that seems to be going with such, such force. I mean, when Newtown happened... I sat down and said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> the whole country, I mean, we're all so upset about this, but were we numb up until December 14th because it had been so frequent? But then all of a sudden it was 26-year-old kids, and we said, oh, we, can't, we can't stand for this any longer. But when 32 students at Virginia Tech were gunned down, it didn't make us all come to a place like this. And talk about it. So I know it's worse since Virginia Tech, but if you had to give your take on how to mobilize people to fight for this, what would you suggest? Well, leverage, I think, is there's way more of us than there are of them. Yeah. That's what's so maddening about all this. So, you know, maybe we leverage our time. I mean, if you live to be 90, that's. 780,000 hours. That's all you get. No. What you do with it. So maybe everyone should spend an hour a day, like a dedicated hour a day, whether it's on Facebook or emailing or phone calling, just I am going to deal with... I mean, I'm going to deal with public engagement for an hour every day, and guess what? It'll make you feel a lot better than what you're dealing I, with half the time anyway. Right, and I, and I, I, I I'm sorry. I, okay. I need to move a, this along because we, we have after. people sorry, after you, I'm, and I, and I'm sure John will see you in the hallway okay. and talk with you. Great, thanks, John. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. That's sorry. that's the million dollar question. Okay, sir. Um, uh, um, Mr. Rosenthal, I just was very struck um, by a comment that. Of all the myriads of um, of um, massive killings, not one perpetrator 
was found to have a mental disease. And uh, I, I wish I knew um, how, what they ruled out. The other thing is uh, they, are, there's a profile emerging. They're loners and single and uh, away from, they, they, sh away, they shy away, they don't join in, yep. and many of them are very rageful and full of vengeance. I mean, uh, sometimes they've lost a job and they'll go kill yep. people. And uh, what I'm trying to, um, and psychiatry is desperately trying to find a profile to pick these people out, and we just don't know. Well, uh, and we just can't, uh, how do you do that? Well, I, we have to make some, you know, it's back to looking in the mirror and what kind of society do we want to live in, and, you know, nobody wants to acknowledge that they have an addict in their family, never mind that any one of us is capable of being mentally ill at any given time. I mean, there's a lot going on these days and a lot of stress, more and more and more. I don't know how parents do it, uh, and I'm not one, but I can barely, you know, get by if my dog doesn't come home for a half hour, you know? I mean, <laughs> so, look, um, the mental health lobby is really strong. I would say at any given time, 50% of America is mentally ill at any given time. <laughs> And no one wants to acknowledge it. And we cut, cut, cut on, you know, so let's arm schools. No, how about putting a psychiatrist or psychologist at schools? You know, a resource officer that, you know, wants to pay attention to kids. But, you know, you may remember uh, the Edgewater Software Massacre in Wakefield, Mass, in a a AK-47 by Michael McDermott. Uh, he had been licensed for an AK-47 pre-93, the, the ban. Um, and he was, uh, he was, in th he was, his family put him in mental institutions three times. So he had a history of mental illness. And when he, when he shot, killed seven people at Edgewater, he was sleeping in a coffin in his home. He was so mentally ill. Um, but because he hadn't been committed by the state, his mental health record was not public. Um, a lot of the shooters, you know, have all kinds of signs that no one's paying attention to. I mean, Cho, the kid that, you know, at Virginia Tech, I mean, he had a serious history. It wasn't public. Jared Loeffner, you know, by the way, I, I was at the White House two years ago, and I, uh, at the, re at the um, request of Governor Patrick to tell Obama, newly elected, you know, a couple of years into it, um, what Massachusetts does so right about reducing injuries and deaths without banning most guns other than assault weapons and how we have this, you know, low firearm fatality rate. And I'm talking to the president's advisor on justice and regulatory policy. He went to the Harvard Kennedy School, walked by our billboard all the time, loved it. And I said, why won't the president renew the ban on assault weapons and require background checks for private gun sales? And I'm handed a list. This Democrats are now in control of the House and the Senate of 75 Democrats, 65 Democrats saying, don't touch guns if you want health care. Gabby Giffords was on that list. Well, her, her life changed pretty darn dramatically. The shooter, Jared Loeffner, he was turned down by the military. He had such a mental health history. But he could buy guns at Walmart? So, you know, we got to pay attention, and we got to spend money on taking care of our mental health in this country until we do. Um, you know, what I, what I said is of the 26 over since massacres, mass public shootings since 93, not one of them had been adjudicated men, as mentally ill. I mean, they were, I'm sure they were mentally ill, but they just, it's so hard to get access to that information by design. The public, you know, the mental health lobby is tough for privacy rights. So we're going to have to address that if we're going to, deal with gun violence. Thank you. Can I take one last question? Mary. I will be quick. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with most of the things that John said, but I want to ask two questions quickly. Um, what can we do about the news media that does irresponsible reporting? 
For example, my son, um, I lost two kids in Roxbury. I lived there for 20 years, and I had a daughter that was murdered and a son who was shot to death, so I'll talk about him. I read an article a day after an incident happened at a club that said, young rapper cut down in the primal life. It was written by Howie Carr. He was 17 years old. So it was a full-page column article about this poor rapper who had been killed. And they didn't mention the fact that he was a gang member and what had actually happened. And when I read that article the day after the incident, I said, oh, my God, they're going to kill my son. That was my impression. And that's exactly what happened. They shot him to death. They assassinated him 10 days before he was supposed to take the policeman's exam. So he was a good kid. The other thing is, why do you glorify um, former gang members? And I hear you, John. I've heard you at least two or three times on WBZ with Dan Ray, with a fellow who sells the Stop Stitching T-shirts. And he happened to be one of the people who wrote the lyrics to a song because they are a rap group and a gang. Um, He wrote the lyrics to a song saying how they were going to murder my son. And there's no question if you ask the police, yes, he did write that song, and yes, they did murder my son. And they were made men, the same people who um, slashed up Paul Pierce, the captain of the Celtics. So that was it. You know, how do you deal with irresponsible media reporting, and why do you glorify former gang members because they're not gang members anymore? I don't believe that. Thank you. Mm. If I may, and in no way, shape, or form would I ever minimize your pain. Um, for me, in my life, I've never been in any trouble. But I will also say that I go the walk that I walk because it it's kind of come full circle for me because there have been some people who would be considered not good people who in a lot of cases saved my life. When I was younger and I was getting ready to go to the park, somebody would stop me and say, you can't go there today. And I'd say, why? And they said, you just can't go there today. And I'd find out the next day that something happened. Now, this person wasn't, by society standards, a good person, but they looked out for me. And there were a lot of people like that. One of the things I ask for when we hire people who work for us is that there be some distance between their past and their presence. Um, A lot of people who do bad things are coming out. And the thing that I want is that they be armed with options when I run into them in the community, because that's where I live, as opposed to being desperate because there's nothing else for them. Um, So for me, it's not about glorifying gang members. It's using some of that street credibility that's only a 15-minute conversation because beyond that, it becomes what can I do to save your life and help you be something other than what I was. And, in, in Mary, in, in that case, I mean, this is a the guy that absolutely had been gang involved, and he, got, he, he approached me along with a rival gang member, um, and they said we are... We've, we've, we're changing our ways. And they created a rap group called Four Peace. And these are two guys that couldn't walk on the same street together, and now they're making music together. They asked if, if they could uh, film a peace video on our billboard, which I did say they could. And, um, and you know, they, like I, I didn't have any relationship with them before that. And they did become friends, and you know now they found God and all kinds of stuff. But you know, I, I, I there's no um, excuse for what they had done. I can tell you that. One of the nephews of my family was in for peace. He got out of the gang when he found out what they did. But can I just say that they still instill fear in the Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan community with the stop stitching T-shirts? Because people know if you tell they're going to kill you or they're going to kill somebody in your family. So they that's how they control not talking. Yeah, uh, I know. And, and I know Antonio did take those teachers T-shirts down. If I can just add one last thing, uh, both to your question about what to do about the media, uh, and this goes to the, the previous question as well. Um, I don't know much about the Boston Globe, 
or the local television stations around here, but building a relationship with your local media, insisting that there are reporters, uh, reporters of color that are hired there, that there are reporters who are uh, given the sanction by the stations and outlets to cover news in those areas, and that they proactively go and find stories that aren't simply the tragic shootings, that they are able to get reporting on the context of a neighborhood that's in-depth and not simply here's someone who shot someone in a club, a gang member, etc. And that's the only thing that you hear. And the reason I say that is that I think for anything to really happen, in order for us to be able to influence things differently, I think that we have to have some broader and wider investment, which I think is what you were speaking to earlier with respect to the Vietnam War. When, I, when you have someone, a child, who might be drafted and in that war, you tend to care a lot more about it, right? When there's some investment, when we look at the school shootings and see a kid, we can all say, I've got kids, grandkids, nieces and nephews that age, so this touches me right here. And we're much more driven to do something about it, much more driven to sustained action, not just, you know, I call up a congressman today and then I did my duty, but sustained action. Uh, and I was going to mention earlier, you know, I don't know what you do with safe streets or what you allow folks to do, but um, go hang out with Ed and see what's going on there to get some perspective, some investment, uh, and some connection in a way that fuels our action, fuels our need to act. And for our speakers and our moderator. Before you go tonight, um, please know that um, this red-headed lady that everyone is trying to echo after she got up there and said, what do we do? She's the president of the Ford Hall Forum. What we're trying to do is take it further than just a lecture where you have this amazing lecture with these speakers and go home. We're now trying to take it further and, and bring it so that you can say at the end of every lecture, what can I do, and connect with the speakers and connect with each other and take it further. If you think that's a good idea, please become a member. Uh, you'll get a little envelope as you leave in, your, um, in, in the brochure, and we'd love to have you as a member. Thanks. Good night. Yeah.